here already, and you can, of course, see her beautiful uh, slide. In 1997, she founded this group, Sustainable Harvest International, and it's a nonprofit group that works on reforestation in tropical forests in Central America. Um, you may wonder who she thinks she is that she gets to do that. Well, let me tell you. Um, she has a bachelor's in international affairs and environmental conservation from the University of New Hampshire. She sounds kind of like a liberal artsy kind of person. I'm just saying. Um, in the early 1990s, she joined the Peace Corps, and then she did this, and she has been working on issues around sustainability ever since. So she is here, perhaps quite obviously, to talk to us about the 21st century challenge of creating a sustainable world. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Flo Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I got here, I saw a hymnal, and I hope I'm not supposed to leave everybody in a hymn sing, because that will clear the room in about 30 seconds. Uh, uh, what I'd, I'd like to start out talking about uh, our heroes, and I'd like to ask all of you to think about who are some of your heroes, who are some of the people who inspire you. And now I'd like to ask you to make room for some new heroes, because I hope that you'll share some of mine. My heroes are, are uh, some of them are a little different than certain people you think of uh, as, as heroes. They're, they're not presidents, they're not movie stars. Uh, my heroes are farmers in Central America. <coughs> and so to start out, I have a little video, just a few minutes long, and it's about some of the farmers that I have the pleasure of working with in Central America. So we'll see if the uh, video works. Me siento totalmente realizado eh, Lograr algo en la vida es algo, es algo que uno lo llena de orgullo Fíjense, cuando usted se pone una meta y, y cuando usted siembra una plantita, usted la siembra con cariño Y, y sabe de que esa plantita le va a producir alimento Cuando inicié yo era un campesino jornalero, eh, yo me dedicaba a ganar mis 120 días diarios, 120 días en aquel tiempo, cuando hace cuatro años. Si queríamos comer una fruta, teníamos que comprar. Sustainable Harvest International's five-phase program empowers families, individuals, and communities to preserve our planet's tropical forests while overcoming poverty. Through SHI's programs, farming families are trained in how to produce food sustainably and organically, rather than relying on traditional but harmful slash and burn methods. Tropical forests provide us with oxygen, stabilize the climate, and are home to over half of the species of life on the planet, yet they are being destroyed at alarming rates. A veces se aplica mucho químico en la tierra, mete fuego a los rastrojos para sembrar maíz, frijoles, y todo eso nos daña todo. Antes de que Fucoso llegara a la comunidad y que yo fuera parte de esa familia, yo hacía igual que la, sin ninguna conciencia, sin ninguna mentalidad. Pero ya cuando vino Fucoso, eh, ya, ya la institución nos enseñó a, a trabajar de diferente forma. Ya todo a base de abuelos orgánicos. Mi nombre es Victoria Esmeralda Sandoval. Vivo en la comunidad de Piedra Gorda. The families of Piedra Gorda are in the beginning phases of SHI's program and are just learning to work their land with organic practices. Their local field trainer will teach them how to make compost, diversify their crops, and save seeds from one year to the next. They will then go on to teach the farmers how to identify markets and strengthen their entrepreneurial skills. After approximately five years, the farmers will graduate with the ability to support their families and become community leaders. Antes va, el costumbre era de, de quemar la tierra, pues, que cosechábamos un poco, va. Entonces ya a mitad de año teníamos que comprarlo, ¿no? 
tratamos, hacemos el mayor esfuerzo de transmitir a la familia conocimientos sobre los principales nutrientes que contienen algunos alimentos, para que ellos mejoren su alimentación. Queremos cambiar ya, queremos cosechar más. Si yo no cuido el entorno donde vivimos, ¿dónde van a vivir mis hijos? ¿Dónde? ¿Qué, ¿Cuál iba a ser el destino de ellos? in Honduras and uh, anything else? They help clean the atmosphere. That's right, they help clean the atmosphere, they help to stabilize the climate, uh, they also help to keep water sources clean and free of siltation which uh, helps to protect offshore fisheries, coral reefs, uh, but it's, it's really uh, it's the biodiversity that is of most interest to me and, and saving these forests is what's always been um, my primary motivation for doing the work that I do. And we've already lost over half of the world's tropical forests and the other half we're losing at the rate of one acre every second. So every second, every second, every second, every second, every second, every second every second, we're losing another acre. And with it, we're losing all of those things that these forests do for us, and we're losing all of that biodiversity. Uh, the world's tropical forests are home to over half the species of plants and animals in the world. And I admit, I tend to be drawn to the cute furry ones, like the sloths and the howler monkeys and the bright colored birds, and and all of that, uh, but there are also many other species that are important to us, and we are losing species as we lose the forest. So we don't know when we're gonna be losing all of this incredible diversity of life that lives in these forests, but we are losing them rapidly. And some of them uh, we, we might not care so much about, they're, they're not little monkeys. Uh, the fer de lance, for instance, a uh, very poisonous snake. Um, so people might think, well, maybe that's, that's one that we could do without, and <laughs> we, we don't care uh, if the fer de lance goes extinct. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that the venom of the fer de lance has been used to um, create medicine to help control um, blood pressure which then led to ACE inhibitor drugs, which are the single best medicine for preventing hypertension and heart failure. And heart disease is still the leading killer in most developed nations, um, but the death rate has dramatically gone down in recent decades, um, and that's because of these medicines that have been developed that have their origins in the forest, so medicines like those that came from the venom of, of the, the fer de lance. And in, in fact, most, I think 90% of our medicines do come from nature. Uh, some of them we can only get from nature, and I think it's about 50% of them that come from tropical forests. Uh, so another example would uh, be the uh, Correr vine here. That is a, a large vine that's found in the rainforest. Indigenous people have used its crushed leaves and roots to make poison for hunting. Uh, but it's also used as a medicine, as a muscle relaxant, and in Parkinson's disease. So that's a, another uh, example. And then the last one, uh, this is the cinchona tree, uh, which is the source of quinine, which is what's used to, to cure malaria. And again, we're losing seven species a day around the world, and a lot of it is because we're losing the habitat as we're losing places like the tropical forests. And one of the most troubling pieces to me is that a lot of the species, we're losing them before we've even discovered them. So we don't know 
what we're losing. We may be losing the cure for cancer. We may be losing the cure for AIDS. We, we, don't, we don't know. Um, and I promise my talk will get more upbeat. <laughs> but I want to lay out the problems first. <clears throat> so for all these reasons, I've been interested all of my life in tropical forests. And, and so I started out looking at, at where they are. And you know, logically enough, they're in the tropics. <laughs> so these dark green areas are where the world's uh, tropical rainforests are today. And then if you look at those areas where forests are, and you compare it with where people are practicing shifting cultivation still, you find that it, it, it's in the same places. And by shifting cultivation, um, I'm talking mostly about slash and burn farming. Um, are any of you familiar with slash and burn farming? Okay, a few of you are. Um, for those of you who aren't, it's pretty much what it sounds like. A farmer cuts down an area of forest and burns it, and that ash is left and helps the crops grow for maybe a year. But then the ash is washed away, the topsoil is washed away, and the farmer has to pick up, move to a new area of forest, cut that, and, and burn that. And I think it probably worked well when it was a small indigenous population, but now the land never is able to recuperate. There's not a lot of topsoil in the tropics to begin with. So a farmer goes back every few years and repeats this cycle, and eventually there's no topsoil left at all. The crops won't grow anymore. The forest won't grow back anymore. And then you find that where we have, have the forests, and then we have this shifting cultivation, like the slash and burn farming, that that leads to desertification. And so this is showing areas where there wasn't desert, and humans are turning the land to desert because of their practices, like the slash and burn farming. And so that guides where my organization, Sustainable Harvest, does our work. Um, right now we're working in three countries in Central America and looking eventually to other parts of the world as well where people are facing these same problems. And in addressing these issues, what we have focused on is providing farmers with alternatives to slash and burn farming so that they don't have to cut down more of the forest every year. Unfortunately, most development, well, most of it's not focused on farming, um, which I don't think makes a, a whole lot of sense since most people who are going hungry are actually living in farming communities. Um, and then what aid there is for people uh, who are living in these circumstances, living in poverty in the tropics, uh, what goes to agriculture usually goes to uh, promoting conventional agriculture, or what one of my board members says we should call it toxic death agriculture. Um, so it's, it's all about chemicals. It's about chemical fertilizers, which over the long term destroy the soil. It's about um, chemical pesticides. Like, so this is a banana plantation um, in Belize. And the blue bags you see around the bananas, they're um, impregnated with pesticides. Uh, and then after they use them, they burn them. So that's what that is. So that all goes into the air. And then they also spray pesticides um, on a regular basis. And many of the farm workers end up dying because of this. Their children are born um, with deformities because of this. And all those chemicals end up running off into the water. Um, and I, I think uh, it's an issue here in the US too. I think in, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, probably all of you are more familiar with that than I am. I think it's causing problems with the fisheries because of the chemical fertilizers that are uh, being washed away. Oops, let that happen. <laughs> okay, clearly it's time for me to move on and um, <laughs> mention global warming um, because uh, conventional farming that is uh, dependent on these petroleum based chemicals, what the heck? Hold on. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's a significant cause of global warming. Um, the burning of forests for agriculture and the production of the, the chemicals that are used are all significant contributors to, to global warming. <coughs> so these are all reasons that our organization, Sustainable Harvest, doesn't promote conventional farming. 
we instead promote a different kind of farming. Um, so now here's where we get to the happy part of the presentation. <laughs> um, this is a farm in Panama, and this is typical of what the farms look like after a farmer has worked with our program. Where they'll, they'll take land that has been degraded and turn it into this. This is a piece of land that um, belongs to a man named Edalberto, and he was given this land so he could build a house on it. Um, but his family gave it to him. But they told him he should never expect to grow any crops on this land because the topsoil was all gone. Um, and a few years later, after being told nothing would grow on it, you can see everything uh, that Edalberto has growing on the land. And so there's Edalberto and his family. Uh, they joined our program because they wanted to see if they could feed themselves and do it in a way that protected the environment, that improved the environment. And the way our program works is we hire local trainers to work with the farmers for five years and take them through our five-phase program to transition away from slash and burn farming, away from chemical dependent farming to sustainable organic farming. Uh, so this is Maribel. Uh, Maribel is one of our field trainers in Panama. And Maribel works with around 30 farmers who have asked to work with us. And she visits each of those farmers every week or two for that five-year period and provides them um, with hands-on technical assistance as well as workshops for the community uh, to learn new farming techniques. And the farmers are really grateful for the assistance that she provides. Uh, and Alberto, uh, in talking about it, said he's grateful to Sustainable Harvest for everything I've gotten. My life has changed since you arrived. All of my accomplishments, I owe the support I received from this organization. Bless you. And that's because of the assistance that he's been receiving for years from Mari Bell to make his farm successful. The way our field trainers work with the families is they start out by just planning with them what they want to accomplish. Uh, they help them sketch out uh, pictures of what their farm looks like when they start, what they want it to look like eventually. And then they teach them different ways to start uh, improving their farm. And there's two basic concepts behind it. Uh, one of them is the idea that healthy soils create healthy crops, which create healthy families, which creates uh, a healthy planet. So the farmers learn lots of different ways to build up their soils and to stop the soils from washing away. And then bit by bit, they add more pieces to it. So that, uh, there's Alberto and his son with their fish pond. So that's one piece of the farm. And I uh, always like to ask if anybody can guess what uh, Alberto's son is doing in this picture. People rarely get it. Every once in a while. I'm hearing murmuring. <laughs> okay, he's feeding the fish. And the way he's feeding the fish is that uh, his dad, Alberto, has cut that big termite nest out of a tree and propped it up over the fish pond. And it's his son's job every day to go and beat on the termite nest with a stick. Great job for a little boy, huh? <laughs> My son's nine years old, would love it if I told him he had to beat on something with a stick for one of his chores. <laughs> Um, and that knocks the termites into the water, and the fish eat the termites, and the fish don't eat at Alberto's house, and <coughs> everybody wins except for the termites. <laughs> and don't worry, they're not endangered. <laughs> <laughs> and all the pieces of the farm work together, so here's the fish pond, and in front of us, and then behind us, you can see that's a new rice paddy, and so the water from the fish pond then goes to the rice paddy and it takes all the nutrients from the fish pond as well as the water down to the rice paddy. So they support each other in that way. After the rice paddy, then the water goes to the vegetables and, and to other crops. So it, it, it serves a variety of different purposes. There's the rice paddy, there's the corn. Um, and. Edalberto, by learning these new techniques over time, he finds that he can uh, double, triple, quadruple the production of his traditional staple crops by growing with these sustainable practices. And it allows him to grow on that same piece of land by his house year after year after year for generations to come, improving the land instead of degrading it and not having to cut down any more of the rainforest. And as uh, Mari Bell helps 
Edelberto continue along in the program. She helps him continue to diversify the farm. And I say that's the other key part of our work. It's healthy soils and it's diversity. So the same way there's a tremendous amount of diversity in uh, the tropical regions in, in nature, we help the farmers replicate that kind of diversity on their farms with all different kinds of fruits and vegetables, uh, fish, uh, along with their staple crops. So that leads to Edelberto and his family not only eating rice and beans, which is all they had to eat when they started with the program, but now um, they still eat rice and beans, but <laughs> along with it they have this variety of fruits and vegetables and other things <coughs> for a healthy, balanced diet. And they cook their food on a new stove now. Um, when the family start working with us, they're usually cooking over an open fire. Um, and so that uses a lot of firewood. They have to cut down 10 big rainforest trees every year to do their cooking. And in addition to that, it also fills the house with smoke. And so particularly the women who usually do most of the cooking are breathing that smoke all the time. Uh, they say it's the equivalent of smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. Not surprisingly, uh, millions of women around the world die young from complications from smoke inhalation from cooking over these open fires. So we help them to build simple wood conserving stoves. They can build with local materials. They use about one third or one quarter of the firewood of the open fire. Um, and they have either a chimney or a secondary combustion process that gets rid of that smoke. So at the same time that it's saving the trees, it's also saving the lives of the women. As I said, we help the farmers to diversify their farms, and part of that is putting trees back onto the farms. And uh, so it could be a coconut tree in this case, it could be a variety of fruit trees, spice trees, hardwood trees, trees that produce nuts, um, uh, trees that shade other crops that grow better in the shade, and, or some trees that are, are planted uh, just to improve the environment, provide habitat for wildlife that creates a healthy ecosystem on the farm. And then all the pieces work together, the, the rice paddy, the, the fruit trees, the peach palm. Over there he's got yams growing, he's got cassava, uh, he's got uh, uh, vegetables growing off to the other side, the garden vegetables like tomatoes and peppers and so on. And so it's providing a diverse diet for him. It's providing uh, biodiversity that creates a healthy ecosystem on the farm. And one of the ways that the farmers grow the crops uh, is in what we call multi-story plantations. So have any of you heard of shade coffee? Yeah? Okay, yes. so a lot of you have. Uh, so what that is, is a coffee naturally grows in the shade of other trees in the forest. Um, there have been varieties developed to grow in full sun so that you don't have to have those pesky trees in the way and you can have just coffee. But when you do that, then you have to have a lot of chemicals to uh, maintain the coffee and then you have all the chemicals running off and causing all the problems we talked about. So we help the farmers to grow coffee the way uh, it grows in nature, which is in the shade of other trees. And they don't produce as much coffee, but they produce more overall because in addition to the coffee, they're also producing mahogany and rosewood and oranges and vanilla and pepper and cinnamon and all these other crops that can grow together um, in, in this forest type environment. And I really like this, this growing system because it provides uh, economic stability together with ecological stability. From an ecological standpoint, it's pretty much the same as a natural forest. It's stabilizing the climate, it's providing habitat to wildlife. In fact, they found 90% of the biodiversity of bird species in these plantations that they find in the natural forest. So it does all those things, but at the same time, it's producing a variety of products for the farmer. Um, so the farmer always has something to eat, something to sell, and they're not relying on one crop. So if the coffee prices bottom out, as they do occasionally, the farmer isn't left with no income because there's a mahogany tree to sell, there's bananas to sell, there, there's always something. Uh, the, then all of this diversity creates a healthy habitat for wildlife, as I said. And so uh, Mari Bell has sent some photos of some of the wildlife that she's found on the farms. And this, this is my favorite. Uh, so these are a pair of hummingbirds that she found living on one of the farms. She's also uh, 
I sent pictures of butterflies and uh, all, all sorts of different wildlife species that now live on the farm, and they and they all work with the farm. And Alberto says these are his workers. Uh, he doesn't have to hire so many workers to come and work on his farm because he's instead of hiring somebody to spray a pesticide, he's got the birds that are uh, eating the insects that are pollinating the plants. He's he's got. Uh, a healthy balance, just like in nature. He's got that on his farm, and so nature is doing a lot of the work for him now that he's established this healthy ecosystem on his farm. Oh, and speaking of uh, species, we have a lot of native species that come back to the farms, um, but we also do have uh, one invasive species that comes in once in a while. Um, that's the gringos. Um, <laughs> uh, so we do have groups of volunteers that come down. There's a group of volunteers um, at Alberto's home and uh, out in, in one of his fields. And the volunteers will come down and they'll uh, spend usually about a week in one of the communities. And uh, they help out with a variety of different projects. Uh, in this case, they were helping to plant tree seedlings. They helped to dig rice paddies and fish ponds. Wherever extra hands are needed, the volunteers get plugged in. And uh, because we have such a long-term uh, relationship with the community, the volunteers are accepted as part of the community while they're there in a way that would be almost impossible otherwise. Um, and working side by side with the farmers, um, Usually the volunteers honestly don't uh, get as much done as the local people would, but it's an opportunity to work together and uh, work side by side and get to know each other. And so the volunteers that have gone with us have said it's a really life-changing experience of really getting a sense of what it's like to live and work in one of these communities. And the farmers really appreciate it also uh, because they say it makes them feel like what they're doing is important, that volunteers are willing to leave more comfortable lives in the U.S. Um, to go down and work with the farmers on, on their projects. So the farmers really appreciate it. It makes them feel like they matter. What they're doing is important. And the gringos are usually pretty entertaining, too. <laughs> then the last phase of work that we do with the farmers is focused on helping them increase the cash income from their farms. Once they're feeding themselves well, we also help them add crops that will uh, bring in money so they can buy clothes, send their kids to school, that sort of thing. So here's Alberto again, and he's harvesting some uh, culantro. Uh, that's a crop It tastes like cilantro, uh, although they're not related. It's used a lot in Panamanian cooking, so he can always find people that want to buy it nearby. And Edelberto, before he joined our program, um, he worked with his father uh, growing some corn and beans, but never enough to feed the family well. And then he would occasionally work on somebody else's farm, um, and he'd get paid $5 a day for a really hard day's work. Um, and, and he said he'd find work maybe four days a month. So his family's income was $20 a month, and he was trying to sustain his family on $20 a month, uh, plus some corn and beans that he grew with his dad. And obviously, that wasn't enough. They weren't. Um, sustaining themselves well. Now uh, they have more than enough to eat, they're eating really well, and they're growing some crops to sell, like the, the uh, culantro here. Uh, it's it's a, a cut and come again crop, um, so he can go through every six weeks, cut off all the leaves, bunch them up, sell them, and then they grow back um, by themselves. He doesn't have to replant, they maintain themselves there. It's by the river, which floods occasionally, which would kill some crops, but the culantro likes it, brings more nutrients in for it. Uh, and instead of making $20 a month like he did working on other people's farms, just the culantro, when he sells it every six weeks, he makes $150 selling just the culantro. And that's one of about 30 different crops that he's growing. Again, mostly to feed his family, but several of them to sell uh, to have more income. And then we, we help the farmers uh, in different ways of selling their crops. This is in Panama. This is the first environmental farming fair that they had in this area. And some people from all around came <coughs> to see what the crops were that were being grown and to hear about how they were being grown working with the environment instead of destroying the environment. And they also go to other uh, fairs that aren't necessarily having an environmental focus, but they set up their stand to show just how well they can produce using the environmental techniques that they've used and to talk about how they're preserving the environment um, with the way that they're farming now. 
and then at the end of the program, um, Edilberto and the other farmers get a little bit of final training about how to be leaders in their community, how to share what they've learned with other farmers, and then at that point, when they have all the pieces in place to continue on their own, to be successful going forward on their own, and, and to share what they've learned with others, then they graduate from our program. And so they, they get a diploma, um, which is proudly hanging on Edilberto's wall now that he's graduated, and he's continuing along on his own. And just lastly, I'll, I'll just mention what happens after the farmers graduate. Uh, people often ask about that. And so I'll just mention this, the Rodriguez family. They graduated from our program seven years ago. Um, and I went back to visit them a few months ago, and I hadn't seen them in seven years. And I remembered they'd been doing well when they graduated. They'd achieved their goal of sending their two daughters to high school, which is something they hadn't thought they'd be able to do before uh, joining the program. They had a beautiful farm. So I dropped it unexpectedly. Um, and Isabel, the father, wasn't home, but Nellie, the mother, was home, and one of the two daughters, uh, Araceli's, she was home. And um, as I say, we, it was seven years since they graduated, but they took me around, showed me their beautiful organic garden, showed me the hundreds of pineapples they were growing, which was providing income for the family, uh, showed me their coffee plantation. So this is standing in the coffee plantation with all the coffee that's growing in the shade of all of the other trees. And as uh, I was asking them about it, uh, well, it was just great to be talking to them because they were so shy when they started in the program that Nelly and Ari Selles would hide in the house every time I came to visit and wouldn't even come out and talk because they were so shy. But now they're so proud of what they've done that they were very happily talking to me about it. And in the middle of all of it, all of a sudden, Ari Selles answered me in English. And I nearly fell over. Um, and I just oh my God, Ari Selles, you're speaking English. And, and she said, yeah, I'm studying it. And so in high school? I hope not, because you were in high school seven years ago. And, and she said, no, I'm in college. Um, she said, my sister's about to graduate from college, and um, I'm halfway through. And so that was something that this family never imagined that they'd be able to do, send their daughters to, to college. And they're doing it all by taking care of the environment and farming in a way that helps the environment. Um, and I was reminded of that fact as I was leaving. I looked back at their farm, and as I was looking back, a flock of parakeets flew over, a wild parakeets, and uh, landed in one of the trees there. And so it was a nice reminder of everything that that family is doing for our planet. And uh, just to wrap up, um, I, I did start this organization, Sustainable Harvest, about uh, 18 years ago. I started it really small. Um, I was working out of a spare bedroom at my parents' house. I was working at a futon store on the side to pay my bills until the organization uh, could pay me a salary. So I started real small. Um, and now, 18 years later, we have more than 1,000 families who have graduated from the program. We have more than 500 families currently participating in the program. And together, they've planted nearly 4 million trees. They've converted 18,000 acres of degraded land to these sustainable farms. And we figure that represents 90,000 acres of tropical forest that won't be slashed and burned because the farmers are growing on the same land every year now. And they've also uh, built 1,500 of those wood conserving stoves that save another 15,000 trees every year. So we're really pleased with what we've accomplished so far. We do have a lot more to do, though. <laughs> Um, around the world, there's 500 million farmers practicing slash and burn. There's 800 million people going hungry on a regular basis, most of whom are, are in the tropics. And we lose 100,000 acres of tropical forest every day. So there's a lot more to do. And so I'd like to end by just um, letting all of you know that you can be heroes for the <coughs> farmers and the forests. Um, and the way you can do that, there's a lot of ways you can make good choices about the foods that you buy, think about uh, where they come from, who grows them, how they're grown. Um, you can also help spread the word about uh, organizations like Sustainable Harvest who are helping the farmers. Uh, I'm not very good at the social media, but I'm sure all of you are, and we'd love to have you do your social media thing and spread the word to others about um, what Sustainable Harvest is doing. On the table in the back, we also have a few materials. Um, we have the old school sign-up sheet for our newsletter if you'd like to uh, get the print newsletter that, that we send out. Um, so 
Thank you very much. Uh, left some time for a few questions and answers, and um, I'll be having lunch in the um, Centenary uh, room at the cafeteria if anybody wants to join me um, after should, this. And you should come join her, because otherwise she's going to sit in the center room by herself. That would be really sad. That would be really oh. sad. So if you don't, if you have after this, we should go join her in the center Oh, and the last thing, if you'd like to get uh, emails from us once a month with stories about the farmers, um, you can do that for our website or you can text the Doesn't word harvest. You're not leaving. You've got some cute pay. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll start here. <laughs> um, what kind of response have you gotten from uh, USAID and the World Bank and those sorts of things? Um, do they support you at all? <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm a hopeless optimist, and so I, I really hope that eventually we are going to come together uh, on this. What I've run into with places like USAID and the World Bank and these bigger institutions uh, is that they're looking uh, for quick fixes. They don't want to hear about something that takes five years. Um, they're looking for simple things. So we're like one crop, they want to hear about markets, commodity crops. Um, so th there's a, a big program now um, of the US government uh, called Feed the Future. And I, I met with those people uh, last October to talk to them, find out what it was all about and how we might fit into it. And after talking for a while, I said, so let me see if I understand this correctly. Are you saying that the Feed the Future program doesn't support to grow food for them for themselves and they said that's right <laughs> no, okay it's all for growing commodities um which by its nature is mostly going to be with, with, with lots of of chemicals and machines and, um, so i hope that will change um that's something um, that we're working on going forward and, and then in my role at the organization i'm working on um is, is trying to collect more data to, to prove the value uh, of this model and to encourage some of those bigger players to, to get, get behind it and shift their resources in that direction. Yes? Um, if we wanted to, how could we get involved in the program and go to the country or Okay. Um, so if you'd like to get involved with Sustainable Harvest and, and go to one of the countries where we work, there's um, some different ways that you can do that. Um, if you go to our website, sustainableharvest.org, you'll find information about that. Um, How did you even have the nerve to say, I can do this out of my parents' garden? <laughs> okay, um, so, so long answer, I'm going to try to get it down to the short <laughs> note of the situation. Um, well, right before starting Sustainable Harvest, I was working for a different organization that um, was not doing what it said it was doing. Um, and I tried to turn things around there. And through them, I hired a couple of people in Honduras uh, to start a program. And when I came back from that, um, I was told by the founder and director of that organization um, that I should stop trying to set up a program as the Latin American program director for the organization. And I should just uh, raise money and let him worry about where it was spent and I should tell the guys in Honduras not to expect to get paid and so on. And, uh, so at that point I resigned from that organization and, uh, and told myself, right, it's now or never. I've been thinking about starting a nonprofit. I probably never would have felt ready or never would have felt capable of doing it, except now I felt personally responsible to the guys I had hired in Honduras and, and the families there. So I said, okay, it's now or never. And um, I think it was really meant to be because um, I, since it's, it didn't seem possible um, with no resources, limited experience, so I told myself that I could have 24 hours to figure out a reasonable way to do this. And that if I couldn't figure it out in 24 hours, I wasn't going to waste more time and that I would just face reality and get a real job and set the idealism aside. Um, and that one day that I gave myself, I got an email from a man in Switzerland who I had met on um, that last trip down to Central America. He was a tourist with his friends. They wanted to see the real Panama. And I told them if they pay for the rental car so I didn't have to ride the bus, that I would take them out to see the real Panama. And never expected to hear from them again. He emailed me on this exact day to ask what was happening. I told him what was happening. He said, well, open a bank account for your new nonprofit and I'll wire you some money tomorrow. Um, and the next day there was $6,000. Um, in that bank account, and I felt like, okay, maybe I really I can do it now, because um, I could send 3,000 to Honduras. That kept the guys there going for the first three months. 
I used the other 3,000 um, to pay the fees to get incorporated, get tax exempt status. I literally I went to the library and took out a book, How to Start a New Nonprofit, and went chapter by chapter through this book of How to Start a New Nonprofit. Um, printed out letterhead, sent letters to every person I've ever met in my entire life asking for a donation, um, and, and then sort of bit by bit built it up from there, flying by the seat of my pants, figuring out as I went along, bringing in other people who knew the things that I didn't know. Um, so it's hard to give a short answer, but that's more or less. And I think anybody, anybody can do it. I have some things going for me, <laughs> um, but yeah.